I hope you uh, all have been, uh, been enjoying your dinner. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get our evening program underway. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Bill Gerstemeyer, who many of you already know. Uh, he's, uh, of course, the Associate Administrator for Exploration Operations at NASA headquarters. So uh, let me turn it over to Bill. Thanks, George. Um, it's my honor to uh, introduce the, the keynote speaker for this dinner activity, and that's Charlie Young, our Charlie Bolden, sorry. I'm losing my mind. Losing my mind here. That was not good, huh? So th I'm doing this so I will never, ever have to introduce anyone else in the future. So, so file this away, George, that he can't introduce people, so this is good, so, so I won't do this. But Charlie Bolden, the administrator of NASA, is here to talk to us tonight and, and give us uh, some thoughts about what we're doing with uh, human exploration and plans at NASA and work that's going on. Again, uh, I'm tremendously, you're tremendously blessed, all of us are, to have Charlie here. Uh, for him to sit in and listen to all these lectures and, and hear all the activity and the discussions is really tremendously helpful for us. Um, to hear the, the dialogue, the international discussions, all the activities that things are doing are really, really important to us. So again, it's, it's a really testimony to Charlie's dedication to this activity that he's made time to come and listen and, and also come here and talk to you this evening uh, about that. So again, it's my pleasure to introduce Charlie and uh, have, you'll hear a great speech. Thanks very much. And um, I'm trying to get Bill out of here. He, for the, some of you may know, you know, he's got a daughter who works here, not here at Rice, but works. Did you go? Go. His, his daughter works here in, in Houston, and, uh, and he, he brought Marsha from D.C., his wife, and so they're trying to get out to have dinner with their daughter, and I'm trying to get him out of here. I was in the back having a beer, and, uh, and I was in the middle of my second beer because I didn't really want to come up and talk, and I was trying to get the courage to do it after listening to some of the discussion this afternoon. Um, and and what, what coaxed me to stop drinking the second beer was I thought that if I kept going, I might turn to putrescine. And uh, is the table going to stand up and cheer? It's a joke. Bonnie, it's a joke. OK. We'll get them back there to explain that. That's some real fancy scientific word that I learned, and they bet I couldn't work it into my talk. <laughs> and I, I knew I couldn't, so I thought I would just get it over in the front. Um, it's really, Dr. Alfred, where'd you go, Bobby? Oh, he's in the back. I want to thank you and George for inviting me to come down. Uh, Ambassador Ridgen, it's always good to have you come out and spend time with us, and thanks for opening everything up uh, today. Uh, it's very special when you and, and, uh, and Secretary Baker take time to come over here. And I, I still have Secretary Baker's speech from, I think it was last year, um, and I use it a lot. Um, I, I find ISMS to be something that's really special to me for a number of reasons. One, because I learn stuff that nobody lets me know when I'm back in, in Washington. Uh, as, you, as you all probably realize when I finally spoke today. Uh, and that's always good. So I, I think you can, you, know, you can go to Washington and you, I tell people all the time, we, when I was in NASA, we generally tried to send people there who were subject matter experts because we wanted to try to give them some help uh, so that the decisions that would made, were made there would be based on sound thinking and common sense and the like. But I found that uh, it doesn't take very long to be there in Washington when the reason you went goes away because Washington takes over. And so that's why I like to come out now and then. Uh, I'm blessed to have a guy by the name of Robert Lightfoot, who used to be the center director at Marshall. And Robert is now essentially the deputy at, at the agency because he's the associate administrator, the, the senior civil servant. And, and we don't have a deputy since Lori left last September. And uh, so, so we're operating kind of the way that Dan Golden did, for those of you who remember Dan Golden, when Dan had Jack Daly, who, who essentially ran the agency. Well, I have Robert Lightfoot. 
And, and I, I could not ask for a, a better partner there because Robert has not been away from Marshall long enough that he doesn't remember what life was like in the colonies as he describes life away from Washington. So, so I come down here to try to see what life is like in the colonies. But, um, you know, both as, an, both as an astronaut and now as the NASA administrator, uh, I've depended on many of you here in this room. Uh, I'm fortunate that, that many of you who are here, Anessa and, and, and many others, have not left. You've stayed, stayed hard at work and uh, continuing to do what you did when I used to be in the astronaut office. And, and you and your colleagues uh, have helped my, me and my crews, and now you help us even, even now that I'm the NASA administrator. And, and I hope you will continue to help in the years to come in the things that we're going to learn and we're going to do together as we try to... Uh, expand our horizons and try to get out of low Earth orbit and, and go and pioneer. And I use the term pioneer on purpose uh, because, you know, we explored up until now. Even during the Apollo era, I would say we were explorers because we went out sort of like if you remember, explorers kind of go out and they see what's out there and then they come back and they tell everybody. And then if people decide they want to pioneer, then they put their stuff in their wagons and they go, never intending to come back again. Well, I'm not trying to do that when we go to Mars. I'm not quite saying I want any of you to go and stay forever. But I, but I do think that humanity is, uh, is destined to be not just on Mars, but at least on Mars to begin with. And I mentioned earlier the NRC report that just came out on, on human spaceflight. And, um, and I think if you take the time to read it, you will see, as they say, they, they agree with us that, that Mars is probably the horizon destination for, for humanity, for, for our species. And you can take it or leave it, you can accept it or not, uh, but I happen to believe that very strongly. And we can, I, I encourage you to ask questions as we go through my talk. I've got some prepared remarks, but I don't have to go past page one. I always find that the value of my coming down here is to exchange with all of you. And so if, you, if you've got questions far away, if you're looking up there to see if I'm going to change that, I'm not. OK, I don't have any slides. So, so if you get bored, I usually tell kids, look at the slides when you get bored with what I'm saying. And I change them periodically. Dr. Alfred said, don't bring any slides. So I didn't bring any slides. So you can either look at station for the next 10 minutes or you can listen to me and get bored, or you can look at Bonnie and, and see what she's saying. So I, I encourage you to ask questions. You know, pioneering, and let me talk about it again. Pioneering is going to require and it's going to demand uh, that we begin to indulge ourselves in operational thinking. And I forgot about that, to be quite honest, until the EVA panel this afternoon. And, uh, you know, having been in the astronaut office, when you talk about getting away from the colonies, um, I, I had forgotten what it was like when I was in the astronaut office, and we thought we knew some things. We didn't think we knew everything, and I don't think, I don't think even in the astronaut office today they think they know everything. But they do know some things, and what they know that no one else on this planet knows is what it's like to live and work in that environment. And so uh, I was sitting there thinking to myself, the value of having that cohort of people uh, not sitting at the table when really, really, really important decisions are being made, like we're making today about the future of human spaceflight. So, so if for no other reason, it was incredibly valuable for me to hear the panels that, that were conducted today, because it, it kind of brought me back down to Earth to, to remember that we're really talking about doing things. And we're not talking about academic exercises. Jeannie Bopp is here, and Jeannie, will, Jeannie won't remember. But uh, you know, you won't remember. You, you're just trying to humor me. Any of you who ever worked with me in any of the life science experiments you know that I used to be a butt. I didn't say I had one. I said I used to be one. And I was one because I always asked when we came back, OK, what did you learn? And they would say, well, we don't have enough data to tell you yet. And I said, yeah, OK, you know, this isn't a science experiment. And, and I know you all are scientists and doctors and all this stuff, but I need to know something right now about what we've learned. Because 
incrementally we're trying to get better and better and better and we can't wait for years to make decisions about where we're going and and unfortunately all of you are in a you're in an occupational field that doesn't give you the the privilege if you want to put it that way of being like other other scientists and, and academicians who get a thousand data points so that they can be statistically relevant before they write a paper or say something. Uh, you've got to make some, some people might call them snap judgments, but you've got to make some informed opinions or informed decisions about things. And um, that's the way we're going to be in, not, in the not too distant future. Uh, because we're going to become front, we're going to become pioneers where we're off to go to another place that humans have never been before. The fact is that there's still much to learn about how the human body will react to the increasing challenges of spaceflight. Every time we think we got it figured out, something pops up and it surprises us. You know, increased intracranial pressure, I know it's not new, but it's relatively new. And um, because I'm not a medical person, I ask myself, is it a zero G phenomena or is it a less than one G phenomena? And um, is, is Paul Spudis here? No? He, he, I really enjoyed his, now some of you will be surprised that I say this. I really enjoyed his talk today because I found that everything he said was more in line with the way I think than most of you would think. Um, I think our difference is He's singularly focused on the moon, and I'm just trying to get us as far out into the solar system as I can. And the moon is too close for me, okay? So take it for what, it, what you will. Um, you know, that's even more reason for us to continue the diligent work of the aerospace medical community, of which most of you are a part. And, and because I want to assure you that we really are on a path to Mars. Um, um, I, I kind of sprang up today when I, heard, when I heard Mike make the statement that, you know, well, whenever we decide that we're going to do some stuff internationally, that's not the way you put it, Mike. Where's Mike? How did you, how did you put it? Uh, I think I was going to say that people that we have great international flights. Yeah. 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 In, in, in Mike's mind, we have not formally said we are in this now uh, as an international collaboration. This, this thing that we call deep space exploration and pioneering, we, we really aren't into it. And as I travel around the world and I meet with my counterparts and talk to our international partners, guess what they all say? You're not into it yet. And so we made one step that we thought would be a, you know, it's not one small step for man or any of that stuff, but it's a tiny, tiny move. We said, okay, uh, ESA, you guys are gonna take the service module for Orion. That was a big risk. And uh, we said, you know, Orion has to have a service module or it can't go anywhere. It's just worthless. And so you're gonna do it. And we worked with Lockheed Martin, and, uh, and I know that's not all ironed out and everything yet, but ESA is the, is the provider of the service module for Orion for deep space exploration, which means if they don't perform, we don't perform. So they are in what you call the critical path. Um, and I think that was really, really, really important. And what we're looking for is more opportunities to give responsibility over to the international partners and to commercial partners. Uh, when I say commercial partners, I just mean American industry to do things that NASA would normally do, but we just can't afford, to put it bluntly. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff, a lot of pieces in this thing that I think most of us in this room want to do, and so we're going to have to collaborate. Um, you know, one of the things that you will see in the NRC study is it says, you know, this flexible path stuff and all that, that's nice, but pick a path. And they said, we're not, we're not real fired up about asteroid redirect the way that you all seem to be, but it's okay. That's one path. Uh, you could go back to the surface of the moon and that's a path. 
But we think that eventually you got to get to Mars. It's an imperative to get to Mars. So pick a path to get there and then stick with it. And the one thing I've learned in my five years as the NASA administrator is people love it when you don't make decisions because then they can do with you whatever they want to do. And so we said, OK, we're going to make a decision. And we have decided we're going to Mars. And the path we're going to take is to put us in lunar orbit as a proving ground. Uh, and the way that we get there is because that's where we want to do the asteroid redirect mission. And it gives us an opportunity to do a lot of the stuff that you all talked about today. When you talked about trying to, trying to figure out how do we change our processes, how do we change our procedures, because the way things are going to work when we get out there and you get around Lagrange points, we don't know how, to, we don't know how it works. We don't know how vehicles fly and how they operate when you get out there. I, I can remember, I'll tell you a story, and I will try not to bore you. When I first got to the astronaut office, BJ may remember this, I, I thought I was pretty good. I learned very quickly I wasn't quite as good as I thought I was. Because I went to the, first time I went into the simulator, and I think it was the SES, not the, not the SMS, the shuttle mission simulator, to do my first rendezvous and docking, or rendezvous and something. And uh, so the instructor was trying to explain to me how you rendezvous with something in space. I said, I got it. And so being the good attack pilot that I was, I saw my target, I put my nose on the target and then put it a little bit out in front of the target and started flying toward it. And if he had let me keep going, I probably would have been doing that for days because we weren't in the atmosphere and spacecraft don't operate like airplanes and orbital mechanics has, an, has a, a, you know, a severe impact on the way you perform and I had to learn that. And I think we're going to find the same thing when we t start talking about operating around asteroids or when we talk about going to Mars and doing the kinds of things we're going to have to do. So we're going to have to learn different ways for the crews to operate and everything. And as you all pointed out several times today, we're going to have to let the crews learn how to be autonomous again, as Walt Cunningham was talking about. And we're going to have to wean the flight control team off being in control. And that's a big, big deal. Now, we talk about psychological things with the flight crew, you know, in isolation. Imagine you're a flight controller. And, you know, a crew goes, <laughs> launches off in an SLS on Orion. And, you know, they get, after the first couple of days, they're, man, they're gone, you know. And they get where communication starts to take a little bit longer and a little bit longer. And then they realize, you know what? We can't do anything. They're on their own. And uh, that's going to take some time to wean even flight control teams off that. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do. I think our approach to reaching Mars involves every single aspect of the work that we have done for decades. Our strategy connects commercial space, the International Space Station, development of new space technologies, the Space Launch System, heavy lift rocket that we're developing, the Orion spacecraft, science, and international and commercial partnerships. And one of the things we're trying to do, and it's really, really hard, is tie science and human space flight together such that they no longer are two silos, that they're, they're one and the same, and they realize that they're interdependent. Uh, I think Bill Gerstenmeier and John Grunsfeld are doing an absolutely incredible job, but there's a lot of inertia beneath them as we try to, because to be quite honest, everybody thinks you want my money. Everything's about money in DC, and so everybody thinks you want my money. So we've got we've to get people to understand, we've got to figure out how we collaborate and how we work better together. That's a lot of pieces to integrate, but it's also a lot of opportunities to build something greater than the sum of the parts. Today, we're Earth reliant. You all talked about that a little bit today. And, and, and operating in low Earth orbit, dependent on the International Space Station, is our toehold to the solar system. Our missions, they require regular resupply from Earth and the ability to launch to space and return, if necessary, in hours or days. When Paul talked today, he said, the good thing about the moon is it's two days away. You know, so we can get there and we can get back. We can go give them help. We can do stuff. So what? Uh, where we're going, it's not like that. And so if you get in trouble, he was absolutely right. If we had had an Apollo 13 type incident on the way to Mars, uh, we would have lost the crew. That's just a given. But that's one of those risks 
that we talked about earlier today that the astronaut crews will have to understand and will have to sign up to. Uh, that, you know, there is no turnaround point. When you, get, when you get going, and you're going for eight months until you come to anything that's gonna be like something you can use, unless I can get Franklin's Vasimer. Where's, where's Franklin? I'm, I'm thinking about it, Franklin. I'm thinking about it, okay. We need speed. Speed is life. Remember that. Huh? I got you. I got you. We're working. Okay. We're going to continue to use station for a while as a way to learn how to live and work in space for the long term. Stations, hundreds of experiments and technologies we demonstrate there are helping us prepare to make the leap farther into the solar system. But as all of you pointed out today, we are learning some bad habits on station because what we're doing is we're learning how to be dependent much more on the ground than we should be. So um, you made me think about that today. Um, you know, from the EVA panel, I, I, I started thinking again about suits and tools and standards. And as we begin to think how we can collaborate internationally, standards are going to become incredibly, incredibly valuable. Because everybody's going to need to be able to play in the game, so the way you enable them to do that is that you establish a set of standards. Everybody can go build what they want to build as long as it's going to fit when it gets there. And we've got international docking standards that we're trying to get everybody to adapt now. We know when my trip to China in 2010, we left uh, access to the international, the proposed international docking standards with the Chinese so that if they wanted to take a look at it and they wanted to give us some feedback, they could do that. Because we felt it was really, really, really important for them as a potential future member of the family of spacefaring nations that they be able to come and dock with the International Space Station or we could go dock with Cheonggang or anything else. And the only way you can do that and assure that it'll be successful is that if you have a set of standards that are agreed to by everybody. Astronauts and cosmonauts themselves are living experiments that are helping us understand the effects of microgravity on the human body. Ongoing human health research and development of technologies to protect and sustain humans in space are at the forefront of our work, along with propulsion systems and spacecraft to take us farther. We talked a little bit about the year-long exhibition, the expedition that's coming up. And, uh, and again, we, we talked about some different aspects of it today and, and different ways of looking at it. Sergey was, uh, Sergey, you know, I think you were quite insightful in, in making us think about, okay, what are we gonna get from it? Or what should we be hoping to get from it? And are our intentions of using it right, you know, maybe we ought to adjust what we're asking the crews to do or, or what, what's the data that we really want to get from that one year of experience. Our industry partners have already successfully demonstrated that they know how to deliver cargo to the station and the next step for us is crew. Later this year, in fact this fall, we're going to uh, hopefully we'll announce the award of, of, I hope, more than one, but at least a contract for the first time for crew services from a commercial entity where we, we purchase the service. And our plan is for those missions to begin by 2017. Most recently, the SpaceX Dragon carried more than 2.4 tons of cargo to the International Space Station, which supported more than 150 investigations. This includes health-related experiments about growing plants in space and human immune system function in microgravity. We now have shown that we can reach the station after several orbits on the day of launch instead of multiple days before we decide that it's okay for the crew to go. And we also have demonstrated that we can quickly return if we need to. We're still close to home base, but no one said Leo or anywhere else we explore would be easy. You know, David uh, kind of, David then just cautioned us today about, about our dependence uh, on the International Space Station for exploration lessons to be learned. And that, that was a caution that we should, we should take seriously. Um, from the ISS, our plan is to move into the proving ground of lunar orbit and cislunar space. Cis and translunar space, since I, I got it, I know. I, was, I, I like to use the term because it's simple, but I understand when you're between the Earth and the Moon, we're in cislunar space. When you go on the other side, we're in translunar. So. Is there a word that covers both? 
Anybody know? Okay, cistrans. So anyway, operating around the moon. Uh, that's, that's the proving ground. And that's where we're going to continue to develop some of the systems that we're going to need to go to Mars. Because, as I said, some of our life support systems can't operate the way they operate on station. They can't operate for, for uh, you know, six months and, and then have a problem, and that's okay. They've got to be much more resilient than that. Things like our mission to capture and redirect an asteroid closer to Earth so astronauts can visit it will demonstrate new technologies like advanced solar electric propulsion. Um, and before we do that, we'll have an uncrewed mission with an integrated SLS Orion system in fiscal year 2017, targeting a, flown, a crewed mission that will go and, as I said before, orbit the moon. Now, what's What's nice about it is that if there are international partners or if there are commercial entities that want to build a lander and go down to the lunar surface, I'm all in. Uh, I think that's great. And, and as I have told our international partners, I only have one requirement, that you give me one crew member. Because if I can get one crew member on a, on a lunar surface mission and have them go down and spend a month or several weeks and we get some data points, one or two, uh, that help us to understand, maybe give us a clue as to whether intracranial pressure is, is less than 1G or whether it's micro-G or microgravity. These missions will help us demonstrate our deep space technologies as we send humans deep into space, but where we are still within days of Earth. We're making a lot of progress right now on the Space Launch System and in Orion, and Orion's first test flight, and it's going to be a big deal, will take place this December, this coming December. Um, we'll simulate a lunar reentry and gather a huge amount of data on Orion's systems, especially the heat shield. It will be the farthest a spacecraft built for humans will have traveled in 40 years. And the other important part, it, it is the first vehicle that this country will have built in more than 40 years for the express purpose of traveling uh, beyond low Earth orbit into deep space. Our NASA Lockheed Martin Exploration and Design Challenge recently gave student teams a chance to take a crack at radiation shielding for Orion. And we recognize five of the winning teams recently in DC, and one of those teams will actually fly their device uh, in Orion to see if it actually works in terms of radiation shielding. Now, that's high school kids. Uh, so we're trying to include them in the game. Again, the ultimate goal is Earth-independent missions to make us Mars ready. So that's kind of the big picture for, for your benefit of what we're doing uh, in DC. Life support, radiation shielding, propulsion. These are just a few of the problems we're going to have to solve. In order to explore an asteroid or return to the moon or someday land humans on the surface of Mars, we need sustained and substantial investments in advanced space technologies. And that's, uh, that's one of our weaknesses in all the progress that we continue to make with Congress in the, in the area of the budget. Uh, we just haven't cracked the, the code on getting them to believe that, that we should be investing in space technology. So we continue to get underfunded there, but, but we keep working because I think without these investments, we won't be able to move beyond the International Space Station. NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate is committed to developing the critical technologies required to enable future exploration missions beyond low Earth orbit. Even as we sit here tonight, uh, I've got teams that are sitting in, on Kauai with the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator Project. It's a huge, 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 funky looking, uh, looks like a flying saucer. And um, we're going to use it to demonstrate uh, the potential to decelerate something as it goes into the Martian uh, atmosphere so that we can take large masses like would be required if you're taking a, taking a, a crew of humans there. Mike Gernhardt and a, land, and a rover as opposed to Mike Gernhardt and his little lander, but to put the, ro the rover with him in it on the surface of Mars. And so, we're hoping that the winds will, will get good and we'll get a chance to actually test that next week. As we continue to move down this path, we'll be focusing on what we need to survive, how humans, robot, robotics, and ground operations can all work together, and of course, how we make it affordable. I, I know this doesn't seem like a big deal to some of you. Uh, 
Cost is a factor, and, and it, is, it is something that we get more and more money the more we demonstrate our capability to do things that we say we can do. When we demonstrate that we, that we can do what we said we can do and we do it on cost uh, and on schedule, I think we'll get more funding. Our work is cross-cutting so that new technologies can be used across missions and science and exploration have more opportunities to collaborate. Our Mars rover Curiosity's landing taught us about precision landing on a tough surface. And it's also sent back data about the local radiation environment. The rover we're sending to Mars in 2020 will tell us more. And we're also, we also have MAVEN arriving on, in Mars orbit this coming fall, uh, looking at Mars' upper atmosphere. And InSight with its drilling and coring capability, which is scheduled to, for a landing in 2016. So these are some of the challenges we face, some of the things we're working on to mitigate these challenges and our philosophy going forward. Just last week, the agency put out a white paper that talks about this path that I've tried to describe to you in greater detail, the technological, political, and the philosophical challenges. Obviously, the technology aspect for humans to reach Mars is going to be difficult, but half of that battle is our commitment to make it happen, and that's you. That's all of you. If there are, eh, let me see, 70 of you in this room, there's more. And 70 ideas on how to do it, and we can't agree, we're going nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. So we've got to make a commitment as a, as a group, as an entity, that Mars is, in fact, the horizon destination for humans. And if it's not, and you all don't believe that, you should stop doing the work you're doing. And you should stop saying that's what you're working toward. Because if you ever try to convince a kid of something, those of you who have kids, you know, you tell them to do something because you really don't believe it, but you're trying to convince them that you believe it. And kids have this sense, this sixth sense that mom or dad, they're lying through their teeth. So if you don't believe it, don't even try to sell it, sell anybody on it. Um, I'm committed to it. Uh, and I think all of us have to do that. The technolo technology aspect, as I said, is just, just a piece of, the, of, of what's going to be required. We've got to raise the bar of human potential to weather the political storms and the challenges we'll face in the coming years. I think we're up to it. I, I know all of you are looking at these problems from a lot of different human health angles, just as we're also working on the technology elements that are intimately connected to the health pieces. The implications of our work are very near term, even though we're also thinking much farther out. As I said earlier, we'll, we'll, we'll be launching astronauts aboard commercial spacecraft by 2017. That's pretty close. The first mission with humans aboard the SLS and Orion is targeted for 2021. That sounds like it's a long way away. That's pretty close. The, the asteroid redirect mission we talk about, if we're not ready to launch the robotic spacecraft that's gonna meet up with the asteroid and try to have it in place, by the mid-2020s, 2020, mid if we're not ready to launch it uh, in the next four years or so, we're not going to make it. And we've got target asteroids, but we don't have the vehicles ready to go yet. So we don't have time to relax and sit back and muddle through what the plan is. We've got to come up with a very firm plan and execute. By building on today's investments in the ISS, the Commercial Crew Program, SLS and Orion, and Space Technology Programs, as well as our robotic science endeavors aboard and on the surface of Mars, the United States is poised to lead the next wave of missions and partnerships to pioneer the space frontier. Simply put, we aim to expand human presence and exploration in the solar system and on the surface of Mars to become pioneers. It's an exciting time, at least for me. It's a really, really, really exciting time to be in exploration for our nation and, and our world. And as always, exploration will help fuel improvements to life everywhere on Earth. That may be no more evident than in the work you do in space medicine. Our road to Mars remains long and challenging, but I'm confident that all of you in this room, like me, are focused and committed to meet that challenge. What we discuss and learn here at the ISMS this weekend will be vital to making progress on our path to the red planet. I look forward to the outcomes of this summit. I apologize that I won't be able to stay around for the rest of the weekend, but as I said, I've got to go back for my son's birthday celebration uh, tomorrow, although he's an old man, but he still celebrates birthdays. So. 
but I do look forward to the outcomes of the summit, and I thank you for your persistent and sustained effort. And since nobody interrupted me to ask a question, I'll give you one more shot at it. And then I'm gonna go back and we're gonna talk about uh, some more future scene. Thank you all very much. You said we can't explore alone. You said that several times. Are we doing many, anything? many, 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 many and times? I, I absolutely believe that. And I think yeah. the ESA thing with the service module is wonderful. Yeah. Well, our other partner has done wonderful, wonderful things in space, and they're very strong. Yeah. Are we doing anything at the the national level or the agency level to to get our Russian friends to join us in this endeavor? We are, and um, you know they're plenty of representatives from, from Roscosmos and IBM P and everything here, and I, I think uh, we continue to work. I, I, I was disappointed, as I said earlier, I was disappointed today, like I said, I'm sitting back in Washington where I'm the last one to find out about anything, but, and, and everybody cautioned me, you know, things take time, but, but I left last year with the belief that all of us were so committed to getting the crews together on station so that we took work into a central repository and, and you know, we shared all the experiments and everything and I guess we're not there yet. And, and I'm told that we're working to get there, but I'm, I'm, an, I'm a patient person to a limit. Uh, I would like to see some, I, I only have, you know, here, here's the truth, okay? I wanna be able to sit in my rocking chair uh, with my granddaughters and my great granddaughters a few years from now and say your granddad or your great granddad was there when we started that. I'm not gonna see any of this stuff that I just talked to you all about tonight. I, I won't be here because my term ends when the president's term ends. And if you noticed all the dates that I gave you, we don't have anything happening before 2017. And that's because we didn't start paying for any of this until you know five years ago when, 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 we, when I got here to be the NASA administrator and we didn't pay enough. We didn't put enough money into commercial crew. Uh, we should have had commercial crew availability long before now, but it cost money, and so we couldn't convince the Congress that it was important, and now they finally agree. But, but we've gotta just continue to be, and when I say we, I, I don't, I know, you know, I'm, I'm representing NASA and the United States, but I'm talking about all of we, the collective we. Every single nation represented here has got to speak up and say we've got to get together and do more. Uh, we can't wait uh, to tie up this collaboration to, to make it stronger. Is that hard? You bet it is. Jean, I love Jean-Jacques Jean Dordain. I think everybody knows Jean-Jacques. He's getting ready to leave as, the, as the, uh, the Director General of ESA this, at the end of this year. Jean-Jacques has a, has a saying that I love to repeat all the time. He said, you know, working by yourself is easy. It's when you decide that you're gonna work with partners that things get really hard. And I think all of us have found that out. You know who the last partner was to come on board the International Space Station? Most of you were there, I wasn't. Who was the last partner to come aboard? Somebody? Russia. Last, last one to sign on the dotted line and come aboard was Russia. And it was only, if I'm not mistaken, I wasn't there, but George Abbey was, and George can tell you probably, that probably had it not been for the, ins the insistence of the president at the time, we may not have done that. The last partner to come on board was now our most critical partner. And we need to keep it. I mean, they are an incredibly valuable partner. And I think it speaks loads, loads, loads to the relationship, to the international relationship of Russia, ESA, uh, JAXA, the Canadian Space Agency, and the United States, that we continue to operate the International Space Station right now as if nothing's going on. It's a strain to do that. But the crews are focused. Koichi is sitting here. Uh, wah? Did I get it right? Koichi, I, I, I listen every once in a while. He has a philosophy called wah which is harmony. And that's the way he approached his, his, his time in command, was he tried to promote harmony among the crew. And he had one thing that he insisted on all the time, if I, get it, if I got it right, we're gonna eat together. 
You know, once a day, we're gonna, I look at Bonnie because Bonnie remembers this. Uh, every crew that's had international partners and international teammates has gone through this. Okay, do we have time to eat together? We better make time to eat together because you got to do something where everybody s floats around together to remind everybody that this is a team and we're in this together. So um, I've become a big believer in WA, in harmony. Koichi, you did an awesome job, by the way. Um, yeah. Very nice presentation. I want to speak a little bit to the biology area. Uh, 50 years ago, we broke the genetic code and understood the, the coding and the replication me mechanism for life on, on Earth. And uh, it was remarkable that there was no other life form other than the code that we broke. And so we're now spending very large amounts of money trying to understand how this code works in life and disease and so forth. If we had the opportunity to obtain biologic samples from Mars and we were able to demonstrate that the life form that we find there is encoded by the same universal code that was discovered 50 years ago, we have an outreach of the knowledge of biology and man from Earth that could reach to entire outer space. At least it's a lead. Mm -hmm. And so it would be very important if we could cooperate with this technical group that's going to Mars to try to get the specimens to demonstrate there really is a universal life form. I agree. You know, if you look at Mars 2020 that I mentioned kind of in passing, uh, one of the things that the decadal survey, the reason we, we picked Mars 2020 as our next big mission to Mars is because that was number one on the, decadal, on the planetary science decadal survey's objectives was Mars sample return. And so we were able, and it was, t let me tell you, tough to get Mars 2020 with a Mars sample return with, a ca with caching. We're not talking about taking the samples and bringing them back. We gotta figure that out later. But just to cache it, getting that through the system, through our government system, for one simple reason, people don't like commitments, long-term commitments in the government. They like, the budget cycle is five years. And so the horizon of most people, you know, who, who, who are sort of our masters, the people that determine our fate, is usually five years. And if it doesn't happen in five years, they're not interested in it. And when you're talking about caching a sample from Mars, they know that's a long time and that's money. And so it took us a while to say, okay, look, we're not gonna, we're not gonna bring you um, a flagship mission that's gonna be $8 billion or something, but we are gonna figure out how to cache samples on Mars and how to get them back to Earth so that we can study them. Because we think that the potential in what we find there is, is just change, it, it will change everything that humanity knows and understands. Just to, to add a comment to that, I think we could, we don't have to return the sample. We can take the detector yeah. to Mars okay. and make the determination of universality of life form and uh, get, it, get us there, and the biologists can return the data very quickly. Okay. Good. Yes? You know, one of the big things that makes international collaboration really difficult right now is, uh, you know, all regulation like export control, IDAR. Is anything being done for that to make those international collaborations yeah. possible? Interestingly, you know, from day one, uh, this will sound political and it's not intended to be, but, but from day one, the president and, and former Secretary of State Clinton really worked hard to revise export control laws and ITAR and all that because the two of them recognized the, the barrier that it caused in terms of true technology development and international collaboration. And so we continue to work uh, to try to get some of those things modified. You know, it, it, if I use our, as an example, my prohibition against any bilateral activity with China, um, I comply with the law, but I go back to the Congress and advise them as they specified in the law 
of who it is we want to work with, uh, certify that, you know, as far as we have been able to determine, we're not working with anybody that's guilty of human rights violations or a member of the PLA or these other kinds of things. And, and these are the safeguards that we're going to put in place to, to protect technology transfer. And with that, we've been able to reinstate uh, collaboration with the Chinese Academy of Science in three areas. In the area of geodetics, which is incredibly valuable because the Chinese do a lot of work there. And what the, the biggest thing we're trying to do is get them to trust to put their data into an international database so that everybody has access to it. That, that's the main thing we'd like to get from them because they have access to everybody's data. You know. <laughs> That's, that's not going to change. I mean, they, they do because all of ours is in the public domain. And if we can convince them, and, I, and we're making progress, to put theirs in an international database, then that's a win for everybody. We're also working with them on glacial characterization in the Himalayas. And, um, and we're starting to see if we can't maybe go back and, and do some other things that have to do with human spaceflight short of you know, saying, okay, we're going to fly together or we're going to look at flying together or something else. But we can work frequently, not around the law, but we can work within the law to get things done. It's just, it just takes time and effort. Yeah. But, but people are really working, trying to change, get the, the laws modified that are, right now everybody recognizes, just stifle the kind of collaboration that we want to have. Yeah. Is that it? Thank you all very much. It's been great. Thank you.